<clears throat> Welcome everybody. We've got 152 people at the end of a day on Friday, your first day back from April vacation if you are a pre-K-12 <laughs> educator. And we know that usually by the end of the day, Monday, all of that rest that you may have gotten last week has gone. <laughs> vacation probably feels like a week, a month, a year ago. And I just wanna start by acknowledging it's been a really hard year in general. And then April specifically <clears throat> has added a new layer of exhaustion and stress. While many of you had some form of in-person learning throughout the year, the first week of April, what was imposed on you was full re-entry into the buildings. Um, this week today, for many of you, if you're middle school and some of you high school, your students came back full time in many instances. And if they didn't this week, uh, they will be soon. All in time for MCAS. Uh, and there is a brilliant MCAS fight roaring across the state in all corners of Massachusetts. There's a real vibrant collaboration between many of you and a lot of our community partners uh, helping educators know their, or sorry, families learn their rights to opt out. Um, we've got about 10 weeks left of the uh, school year. If you're higher ed, you only have a few weeks left of your school year, and yet there's still so much to do. There's so much to do in terms of winning funding, particularly for higher ed, so that we can bring back all of the, the our coworkers who've been furloughed or laid off. Uh, we have a real crisis in student enrollment in higher ed, particularly in the community colleges, and particularly with our Black and Latinx students who are unenrolling at high rates. And it quite possibly could continue on into the fall. We've made such important progress on the Student Opportunity Act. We've gotten almost everything. We're about $90 million short because they don't know how to count students. The count is actually based on October 1st numbers from last year. And uh, we're down 35,000 students. Many of them are five and six, six year olds. So we believe they're coming back and SOA should be funded, uh, not just based on one year's data, but on multiple years of data. Uh, so we've got an amendment in to say that as soon as DESE knows the numbers earlier than October 1st, they should start releasing more fundings to districts. All of this on top of having a year of learning how to be an educator during a pandemic. Um, but we are close. We are close to the end. We are close to the summer. We are in the warmer weather. We are vaccinated at higher numbers. And I just want to share some exciting news about some polling data that I think will lift your spirits. Every year for probably five or six years, we've been polling a couple of times a year around the big campaigns, whether it was the um, question two or fund our, uh, fund our Future or the Fair Share Amendment. And in our polling, while we're talking about issues, we are also polling on people's attitudes towards educators. And again, we just did a round of polling to find out about the Commonwealth's priorities for budgets and their thoughts about this idea of learning loss, their opinions of educators and unions. Danielle, would you put up the, the slide that shows the overall findings? While you might not feel this because if you only pay attention to what's happening on social media, or at your local school boards or town meetings, you might get a different story. But here's the real story. We are in an incredible moment where we can transform public education and get people to understand that public education doesn't end until grade 16, right? And to, to have a much more progressive education system. Educators favorability quite, uh, is quite high. Support for funding up through higher education is exceedingly strong. And parents and non-parents really support a progressive model of education. 
let me tell you some more specifics. 64 percent of the parents and voters believe that the jobs of educators have become harder during the pandemic. 79 percent, well, within that 79 percent, 27 percent already had a very high opinion of educators, but now 79 percent have an even higher impression of educators. And 79% agree that the MTA's leadership on environmental health and safety conditions protects educators, students, and the entire community. So all of that anti-union rhetoric that you've been hearing out there is just simply not holding. It's not true. 70% of the people we polled agree with canceling MCAS. 77% agree that programs as we return to in-person learning, full in-person learning should focus on the whole child. And 66% say that we have an opportunity as a result of the pandemic to reimagine schools and meet students where they're at, provide them with supports that nurture resilience, help them adjust to new circumstances and change curriculum and practice to be reflective of more meaningful learning. And 76% believe in a teaching philosophy that says true learning addresses the whole child, centering on academics, social and emotional health, and personal growth. They believe that when our curriculum reflects our students' identities, whether it's by race, ethnicity, class, gender, gender identification, that's when students feel affirmed and they're motivated to learn. And they believe that true meaningful learning is never lost. That's all because of you. The public is with us. So anytime you're feeling down because you've read a social media post that's kind of negative, um, or you've heard a negative comment from somebody in your community, keep these statistics in mind. The overall society is with educators and is with unions. So I hope that will lift your spirits. And next week is teacher National Teacher Appreciation Week. But we know that the people that work in our public schools and colleges are not just teachers. MTA members are educators of all different kinds of sectors. The you paraprofessionals, paraeducators, or bus drivers, or cafeteria, or custodial, or staff at higher ed, um, librarians, nurses, so much more than just classroom teachers. And we will be putting a note of appreciation out on our social media next week to really just honor all of the educators, be they classroom teachers, or other sectors and even retirees. Um, you've built this public education system. It's your week to be celebrated and we wanna celebrate you and recognize how important you are to society. So with that, we'll move on to the meeting. I wanna share, a, we'll, we'll start off with a couple of technical things for you to know. And just as a reminder, this is the pre-convention. We don't do any debating or speaking in favor or against. We're just asking questions. So tonight's presentations will be about three main things. We'll talk about the budget and that will be a chance for you to ask questions, but we don't vote or debate. You'll hear about the changes in the resolutions and you'll, uh, we'll review each and every standing rule change and bylaw change that will be considered uh, for a vote at the annual meeting. And then at the very end, we have candidates contested elections for various board seats. There'll be an opportunity for you to hear from the candidates. And if there are any candidates that are here today that haven't requested a chance to speak and you'd like to uh, just notify Mary Gilgallen or you can put it in the chat as we get to the end of the agenda. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, oh, I also just want to introduce everybody who's helping to run tonight's meeting. Max Page will be here to talk about the budget. Our executive director, treasurer, Lisa Gallatin, will also be here to answer questions about the budget. 
Kathy Conway, our Director of Finance and Accounting, and I believe Anne McGuire is our Comptroller from uh, Finance and Accounting. Tom Estabrook will be here talking about the resolutions and Pete Schoonmaker, Schoonmaker will be here presenting the bylaws. And I wanna give a special shout out to Kathy Conway, our Director of Finance, who for a couple of decades has made sure that MTA can have a strong, healthy budget, financial security, and uh, grow and do progressive things and keep us really strong and anchored. And Kathy will be retiring at the end of this fiscal year. So if people want to use their reaction button just to give Kathy a sign of appreciation, Kathy is going to be hard to replace. <laughs> we also have running the behind the scenes, um, Mary Gilgallen, who's our Director of Governance, Danielle Allard, and Bria Bremser and Sarah Ibanez, who are all working out of our TPL training and professional learning. They are what's making the Zoom possible. So I'm going to turn it over to Danielle to talk about the logistics of participation. Thanks, Mary. So like uh, Mary just said, there are no special rules or debate during the pre-convention meeting. So in order to speak, you do still need to be recognized. So we're asking that you please use the raise hand feature, which is in that reactions uh, button at the bottom of your screen. And then our vice president, Max Page, will manage the order of the questions um, from the delegates that are coming in. Everyone in the meeting will be muted and we have turned off the chat uh, for this meeting. And we're asking you that uh, to also please rename yourself. Uh, it just helps us to be able to assist you if you do need any technical assistance. Um, if you have any other questions that need uh, further answers, please email us at events at massteacher.org and we're happy to help you. And that's it. Thanks, Danielle. And now I'll turn it over to Mary Gilgallen, who's going to talk about the specifics and the logistics of annual meeting. Thank you, Mary. Hi, everybody. So this is our second um, virtual annual meeting. So it's quite different than, than normal. And at the end of the week on third, um, Friday, April 30th at one o'clock, we will start our annual meeting. We will then start again on Saturday at 9 a.m. Everyone should have received a printed delegate handbook and your budget by now. All the delegates who have been registered to date should have received those in the mail. If you opted to go green, you um, can access all the same materials on our website. The annual meeting website is mathsteacher.org slash annual meeting. We'll put a link in the chat now so everyone has that. But that's kind of a dashboard and all the resources are there online. The deadline to submit new business items for this annual meeting is Wednesday, the April 28th at 5 p.m. No new business items will be accepted after that time. Tomorrow, we will be sending all the delegates your vir virtual login information. Your credentials are unique to you. So please look for that email tomorrow and don't forward it to anyone as it's specific to you. Please read the email carefully as it contains important technical information and the process to be virtually recognized if you'd like to speak during the meeting. Delegates must, must access the meeting platform using a computer or a laptop. Windows PC, Macs, and Chromebooks can be used. The preferred browser is Chrome. Smartphones and tablets cannot be used. There will be a delegate test access session on Wednesday, April 28th from 4 p.m. to 7.30. It's kind of like an open house. You can stop in. You will get that email. You can test your credentials. Once you go there, you'll clearly see you had success and you won't have to worry about your access on Friday when annual, annual meeting comes. And that will be, as I said, open from 4 to 7.30. Unlike last year, this annual meeting will have all the traditional annual meeting items. Special rules were developed 
by the Bylaw and Rules Committee in consultation with our parliamentarian, Jim Slaughter. The special rules were reviewed by the MTA Board of Directors at the March 6th board meeting and are being recommended for adoption for the annual meeting of delegates. They please review the special rules before we get to that item on Friday. It will be one of the first agenda items. We know everyone is experiencing Zoom fatigue. While leadership has been putting the agenda together, there have been concerns about the amount of time that we have for the virtual meeting. There are rules that outline time limits. So we just ask you to look at that in advance and um, understand that these things have been put in place because of the virtual meeting and we have um, business from last year and this year, and there's a lot to do in two days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Okay, so let's move on to agenda item number three. Max Page will uh, present the proposed budget and the dues for the 21-22 fiscal year. Um, again, this we're not gonna be voting um, but we will open it up to conversation after Max does his presentation. So Max Page, welcome. Great, thanks Mary. Sorry everyone, I was late. I was at a legislative forum. I didn't want to miss the chance to say hello to Rep Carol Doherty, former president of the MTA who's now in the legislature and is a great advocate for all of us. So it's good to see so many people here. I hope you had a great um, restful break last week, well-deserved. So let me see if I can share my screen. And what I'm gonna do is give a presentation about both the operating budget and the public relations organizing budget, both of which we'll vote on successively at annual meeting on uh, Saturday morning. So I'll just go through both of those and then we'll just open up for, for questions thereafter. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Okay, I hope everyone sees that. Good, um, okay. So let me just start with the budget process, um, which is uh, basically you know, an eight month long process. We start with um, setting by the executive committee and then the board ratifying a set of budget priorities. Um, they set those in October, although we discussed them in, even in September. And then um, the, that line, the executive director treasurer, essentially that's the management budget. The executive director treasurer in consultation with Mary and myself and after meeting with every single department in the MTA, develops a proposed budget. That gets sent to the member advisory budget committee, um, which spends two long days at least, um, going through line by line, thinking about it, discussing it, discussing all aspects of it, and coming out with um, any changes and developments from um, the proposal from the EDT. That goes to the executive committee, they discuss it, make any changes, recommended onto the board of directors. Um, so, and then the final step is all of you at the annual meeting of delegates this Saturday, where we will vote on a, on a recommended um, um, budget. And it has been recommended, um, I believe unanimously at both the executive committee and the board of directors to you, the annual meeting of delegates. Now I usually, um, let me put the next slide here. I usually, um, put this at the end. Um, these are the advisory budget committee. I really want to especially thank them this year uh, for their, you know, especially good conversation. You know, the, the issue here is unprecedented. We're trying to make a budget that takes us all the way through June 30th of 2022 while we were developing this in the midst of the pandemic. And as you'll see, there's lots of ups and downs and things that we have to, um, consider and deal with. So they work especially hard, really thoughtfully. But I especially want to highlight that name third from the bottom. Um, we have our great staff, Nancy and Ann McGuire. But I want to especially um, acknowledge Kathy Conway, Director of Finance and Accounting, who is after, I'm forgetting the number of years, I think it's 18, is will be retiring from the MTA this spring. And that is wonderful for her and terrible for us. <laughs> uh, she has been just an outstanding, outstanding custodian of the finances of the MTA, and we are in stronger financial position than we've ever been, and runs an absolutely top flight professional, um, just absolutely clean and professional um, budget operation and finances for the whole organization. So uh, maybe, maybe I don't know if Kathy's on and can give a quick wave, uh, but we really owe her an enormous, enormous debt of gratitude for her many years of service to the MTA. 
Okay. And Kathy, you'll get, uh, I'm gonna embarrass you once more at any <laughs> meeting, don't worry, <laughs> you deserve it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm especially proud of the members who have really taken this, the, they took the finances seriously during my tenure and have done everything they needed to do to shore up the finances of this organization. So the, 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 um, the uh, accolades go to the members for taking such responsibility for this organization. Well, thank you, Kathy. And you know, we all want to leave some kind of uh, good legacy for many years of work, and you are leaving the MTA in much stronger financial position for its members for for many years. So, all right. So this is Kathy's budget, what I'm going to present. <laughs> um, we'll start with the operating budget, and so this is the the I like to say this is you know this this um. This slide of numbers of members is actually always moving to me because I'm giving a budget presentation and I have to look at the membership because the number one thing about this is our union is run by member dues, almost 100%. And that means that it is, we are not dependent on big foundations. Or we're not dependent on a wealthy individual like Bill Gates. We're dependent on our members who, who provide the dues to run this organization. So we have to look at the membership and make predictions, frankly. We have to make educated predictions about where we'll be over the coming year. So just so you know, well, this is something we just have to confront. The pandemic has, um, has brought our, temporarily we hope, our membership down. So we are down, if you look at members, actually just individual educators, we are down by 2000. And, and as you can see from March, if you look back to June 30th, 2020, which is the end of the, uh, the fiscal year, at the start and the beginning of the new fiscal year and where we are now, we're down by about 2000. Um, but let me look at, in terms of budgeting, we don't look just at pure total numbers of individual educators. We have to look at full-time equivalents. And for people who don't know about that, like if you have a, two half-time people, that's one that together makes up one full-time equivalent. Um, and, or if we have uh, members who pay different level of dues, we try to, we could pull them together to call that one full-time equivalent, full paying or uh, um, operating dues. So that's why you see these numbers. These are the numbers of full-time equivalents we have who are who pay the full, you know, altogether pay the full dues. So you can see we're down by about a thousand between June 30th, 2020 and March 31st of 2021, almost exactly down by 1000. So a big discussion was how we estimate over the coming year where we'll be. Where we came down on after lots, after lots of discussion was that we would use the same number we used this past year, 89,290. What that means is we believe we will recover. That means recovering a thousand members, full-time equivalents that is, to get back to a little over a little over a thousand to get back to where we were. Um, and we believe that given the massive federal funding money that's coming in and because of where we see the, the debate on the Student Opportunity Act, the funding for public education going, we feel confident that there's actually gonna be bringing back people. Um, there's lots and lots of people who were, who were laid off um, or there were retired people who retired last summer who were not replaced. There were many hundreds of adjuncts who um, did not get, get their classes. So we suspect as, as schools go back fully in person and colleges and universities that we will recover a lot of the membership. What we didn't do was estimate beyond that. We felt like it wasn't wise to say, oh yeah, all this federal money, good state money, we're gonna actually grow by a thousand or two thousand. We just felt like that was not that was not wise. So going returning to the level that we've been operating under this year seemed um, seemed legitimate and wise. Okay, so that leads us to this: an annual operating budget of um, 49,727,962 based on this estimate. And this is the estimate that will take us all the way through June 30th of 2022. Um, and we believe it'll, it will, we're using the number of 89,290, which is the number that we have for the current budget. That leads to this full operating budget dues of 483, um, uh, for secretaries, clerks, and custodians, $290, and for aides, food service personnel, and other education support professionals, $145. And then shown in a different way, um, you see that in the center column there, or the second to the from the right, that's the operating dues, 480. And then on the right, if we pass it, uh, is the two is the same level 
for the public relations and organizing dues, $20. For a total, as you see in that um, column, $500, that's what it was this current year. The next year, with uh, that dues increase of $3 for full-time professionals, $2 for secretaries, clerks, custodians, and $1 for aides, food service personnel, and other ESPs, that would yield the dues rate you see below, 503 um, for, uh, for full-time dues. And I want to be clear, that's obviously for the whole year. That's not like a weekly or a monthly increase. That's the, that's the amount total increase in dues that is being proposed. I'll note that the NEA, um, that are obviously the representative assembly of NEA happens in July, but their proposal, which is usually accepted, is a $2 increase for what they call full-time professionals. I don't like that phrase. Everyone's a professional, but what they call full-time professionals um, and, and zero dues increase for, for ESP members. Okay. Um, so this is now getting into the budget, the details. Um, so the membership base, again, so we, uh, the membership base, we are saying it's the same number, 89,280. We're keeping that no change. But because we're slightly proposing raising the dues, $3, $2, and $1, as you just saw, uh, that will produce a little bit more on the revenue side. Also going up is the um, NEA Unisur funding. Essentially, NEA, our sort of parent union, sends money back to support our field operations. And um, because we actually have more um, field rep organizers that we hired that's part of the Blueprint Project, more money will be coming in from NEA. Another um, upside on the revenue is that if you may remember last year, we actually estimated zero um, revenue because in our, in our Hanover and um, insurance kind of arrangement with through MTA benefits, MTAB, um, they, have, they have been paying us uh, for many years for essentially to be the kind of the exclusive insurance provider or the one that gets advertised through our MTA benefits. Um, you all are, of course, our outstanding um, customers and clients, educators are. And, but then they were trying to renegotiate this and we weren't sure whether they would just leave altogether. So last year we estimated zero. We actually managed to negotiate something with them. So you will see now that the, the, the royalty will be $300,000 from Hanover and Liberty Mutual, a second insurance company that will be joining Hanover and offering their, um, their offerings to our, to our members. I will just say that, note this, I'll get to this later, that the, sort of the arrangement is that we also do advertising um, on behalf of those policies for home and car, life insurance. And so um, that 300,000 is offset by the publicity expense line. So the bottom line is there is, is that we're, 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 the budget is proposing a 2.52% increase over last year. Okay. So I want to just highlight the expense uh, increases, and then we'll also look at decreases. These are, again, highlights. Um, and this is what we've done it for the past several years. We'll take questions on any line item. And as I've offered over the last you know, month is anyone can send um, questions to me or Kathy, and we will do our best to answer them. And of course, we will also have a discussion at, at annual meeting on Saturday morning. So um, there is increases in, in salaries. Um, I wouldn't say that there's a, a one extra position in um, the in that's going to be in, in legal and human resources, and also as part of our blueprint process last year, we added 16 new positions out coming out of the blueprint where people members you all said that you really wanted greater support in the field in your local leadership development, you know, advice and support in bargaining. In other in other efforts, and so we are. That's one of the great things that happened that we this year strongly in, in expanded the support we have in our regional offices and down to every single local. And we had built that into last year's budget, but we actually were able to add one additional. But we in part way through the year, and so that needs to be covered in this budget. There's also increase in wages because of our uh, contractual step and wage increases for Matasso. That's our Matasso union of our. Um, clerical um, unit in the MTA. Um, when you have more staff, there's also more um, payment to, to, the, to FICA. Um, and similarly, 
health and health and dental insurance. We again, it's an unprecedented thing that we did coming out of the blueprint is to reinvest in um, in more um, staff throughout the organization. Um, we also, you can see there's our, the paid family medical leave benefit that was implemented this year, that there's, a, there's an increase there. And of course, as you all know, we've been spending a lot of time on, on Zoom and other forms of technology. And so there's an increase in our various online software licenses. And then finally, this is what I was just referring to about MTAB on the bottom right, is that even though that we saw the revenues go up, we also committed um, to to paying uh, for some publicity around those insurance policies. Last year we had zero revenues. We also had zero payment on for the advertising. So there was the savings that way. Okay, so these are decreases on the expense side. Um, what we've been really trying to do, and I thank again the ABC and Kathy and um, Ann McGuire for really looking closely and saying, what, you know, what have we really needed year to year? Um, in this particular line and where we could, we cut this back. And I should say the goal was to limit the dues increases as much as possible. And what we did, you saw it's $3, $2 and one, depending on the, the, um, the, the type of dues one is paying. That's exactly what we did last year. A very, what seemed a modest dues increase that will allow us to further invest um, in potentially in new staff in areas that members, you all, said were important, such as communications or training and professional learning um, or our research division. So it felt in the end that it was wise to do that and allow us to continue those blueprint investments. Um, you can see that though we've dropped the amount in part-time staff because of the actual experience. Um, we think that the, our pension system, our pension for our members is in such good shape that we can, we can um, lower that projection uh, projected contribution a, lit, a little bit. Um, mileage travel was very much down this year. It obviously it will be down somewhat, but we expect to be back to, we hope, back to regular travel in and around the state by our, our staff and members to committee meetings and the like. So we were able to make some savings there, but um, we recognize that a lot of, of travel will come, come back into being. Similarly, out, outside attorney's fees, um, we are not needing as much. I mean, and we're, or we're handling more inside our own talented uh, legal staff. And so we were able to decrease outside attorney's fees line. Um, now this is an important one, which is these next two on the right side. So we're not, there is no in-person NEA representative assembly this year. So we don't need to send delegate stipends or no travel for all the, the RA delegates. Um, nor, similarly, there's no convention expense of, you know, renting the rooms for our, our uh, state affiliate meetings. So that's a savings this year, but just signaling that we will want and need to put that back in the budget for FY23 when we come to this year, next year. Now, hopefully by then we will actually have seen an increase in membership and a return and even a growth, but just a highlighting that it's a good savings this year of over $250,000 but that we have to be aware of that for next year. Finally, um, is that we have, uh, we have the contingency line is much smaller than last year. Again, to keep uh, dues down, we, we have a very um, small contingency, but um, do, it does include sufficient enough to um, potentially hire one or two more staff in key areas to serve members. Okay. Let me quickly do the public relations and organizing budget, and then we can take questions and have discussion. So these are some of the spending initiatives that the public relations and organizing committee has invested in, including the, the spring campaign around vaccines for educators, fund our future on the Student Opportunity Act and Cherish, stop the MCAS. We of course continue to um, provide extensive local organizing grants. Those have been incredibly popular for people to hold events, rallies, get t-shirts, and other things. Uh, we continue to support uh, the Raise Up Mass Coalition and that actually will be a very big issue I think in the coming year is supporting um, the movement to win the passage of the Fair Share Amendment. We should be voting on that in November of 2022. So we will wanna account for that in the budget for the FY23 um, budget for sure. Um, we have a, a mentoring program for rising ESP leaders, scholarships for um, students 
for our members to become students in the, the UMass Labor Center. It's been very successful. These sort of rising leaders are, are on their way to getting a master's degree in labor studies. And um, also been have seeding, providing some money to support local initiatives to develop alternatives to the MCAS and high stakes testing. And then finally, we also do straight up um, just, you know, um, a public relations or about for the MTA. And one of the most popular is this, we support both the MTA member led WGBY schools match wits um, competition, which I say my, my daughter is actually uh, on, a, on one of those teams, as well as the more Boston based WGBH high school quiz show. And it's very visible. It's amazing how often Mary and I get stopped by people and say, hey, I saw you on that show talking about the MTA and what it does. So that is, those are some of the things that the, um, the Public Relations Organizing Committee has spent. I will say also that we, there's a lot of the money has been set aside with the full knowledge that next year we will probably want to spend extensively to win the fair share amendment, maybe win a gubernatorial election and other, other initiatives. So this is, the, this is the budget recommendation. The total budget is uh, $1,785,800. Uh, $1, uh, that's based on this same number, 89,290 full-time equivalent active members. And the, the dues for public relations and organizing breaks down this way. $20 is the full-time dues, $12 secretaries, clerks, and custodians, and then $6 for aides, food service personnel, and other education support professionals. This is the same amount and the same division as it was proposed last year, and that was implemented. Okay, I'm going to turn this off now and take whatever questions may be out there. Okay, I see Dennis Naughton and Rafael Mora Arasso. So, Dennis, go ahead first. Thank you, uh, Mary. Um, I have my first question is regarding uh, the outside attorney's fees. Uh, as, uh, as articulated in the booklet, uh, those fees are spent generally for specialty attorneys uh, in particular situations as you have enumerated there. And I understand that the idea here, correct me if I'm wrong, is that there was a difference between the amount adopted last time around and the amount that was expended. I know from my own experience that can vary a great deal from a year to year. So has that been a trend over, let's say, the last three or four years, or is that just something over the past year? Um, so, so Dennis, I'm going to turn it to Kathy in a second, but um, when we made those adjustments, we looked at the past several years and tried to kind of look at the average and we noted that it was on, it was on average um, well above. What I would say, though, is that, um, you know, the budget is, is during the course of the year, as you well know, things may arise, if there's, a, if there's a desperate need for an outside attorney, we will find a way to do that. Or we'll, if, de, if it gets to that case, we would propose to the, the, to the board that we take money from reserves if it's that important. So, um, but that is based on that. If, tell me, Kathy, if you're on, can you answer Dennis's question about um, how we got to that, that uh, lower number? Sure, I'm happy to. Dennis, on page 106 of the budget book, um, there is uh, the trend. You can see the trends uh, over time for that line. And um, going back to 2016, 17, 1.9 million, 17, 18, 1.8 million, 18, 19, 2.1. That was the highest year. Um, so we felt comfortable reducing that to 2.1 because that was the highest spending year we had in the history um, and the re in recent history. So Just a quick follow up, if I may. Uh, when the decision is made um, in a case like this, to, to what degree and how uh, are legal staff involved in the decision making? Yeah, we talk with the management team, um, the managers and the legal staff. We have, uh, and so we don't just arbitrarily cut that without being sure. And normally a manager would come to us, but in this case, I remember saying, I think you got a little bit too much money in here and we could probably cut some and they agreed. So, um, so the initiative came from outside the legal division. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Dennis. Okay, next we have Rafael. Rafael, are you on mute? No, not there anymore. 
Okay. <laughs> Hi, Raphael. Yeah, uh, Max, I have this question uh, uh, about, I understand that uh, a new organizing MTA representative position was uh, uh, agreed to be funded to coordinate environmental and health and safety issues in this year, in this fiscal year. Uh, I understand there is an ongoing search for the position at this time. So my question is, uh, is this position, if Phil, going to end this year? And what are the projections for next year to have this kind of organizing service on environmental health and safety in the MTA? Right, no, good question. You know what, um, is it, it's okay, Mary, we'll turn it to Lisa, if you're on, Lisa sure. Gallatin, to talk about where that search process stands. Yep. Uh, yes, the, this is a temporary health and safety organizer position um, that the uh, executive committee and board voted to fund through the end of this calendar year. So that's uh, 12, uh, December, 20, December 31st, 2021. Um, the discussion and decision about a, a potential position going forward was not was not a part of that discussion and uh, was not a part of this budget discussion. So that would, if that were to be raised, that would uh, happen not through um, the already existing process, but through some future process that that might be initiated. And we are we are. Um, uh, it has been difficult to fill that position as members of the EHS committee know, but um, we are close to having found a candidate and a solution, I believe. I'm not, I'm not able to share that um, uh, today, but I'm hopeful. Thank you. Thank you. If, if follow up is that the, the rationale for, for the position uh, was the issue of uh, that uh, there was a lot of requests for uh, services that came out out of the COVID pandemic. And there was a lot of environmental health and safety issues, especially in air quality issues that happened in a lot of locals around the, the MTA. And, and that the, the decision to make the position was pretty much tied to the current pandemic. Uh, but I wonder if there was any consideration that this, uh, uh, I mean, we all hope that this pandemic is going to be a one-shot deal, but you know, but the issue of uh, uh, environmental quality in, in the classrooms is a continuous issue. So I wonder what's the rationale to say that this is a temporary position and that there is not a discussion about to make this position something that uh, could transcend the pandemic. The, the, um, the decision that was made was to fund a temporary position because of the pandemic. Uh, and yes, we, we do hope, I think we all hope that this is a one-time uh, experience, but of course um, uh, the future remains to be, to be told. So uh, what was also decided is to focus this position on helping locals to build up and establish health and safety committees because it's having an active health and safety committee that's going to enable our locals over the long run to not only address the COVID health and safety needs, but other health and safety uh, needs and issues that, that might arise. Rafael, I'll just add, um, just to end, like, I think the idea is get someone in this Let's see how this goes. Let's consider this where how it need, how those needs need to be met. Maybe that becomes part of the next budget. Maybe there's a way to extend it. We just have, I think we have to just see. This is a sort of a new a new position, but there's ample time to kind of consider how how to fund it ongoing if that's what seems to be best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Raphael. Okay. Next, I have Eric Champy, then Claire Naughton, then Margaret Crow. Thank you. I have a few questions, please. First of all, line 20, the Boston office rent. How much specifically are we paying for the Boston rent and how many employees are up there? Um, Kathy, do you know the exact rent we pay for that? We have the entire government relations division is there, which would yeah. be six people are in that. And if you, if you remember, Eric, we, um, 
saved about $100,000 a year by basically taking half of the space that we used to have on the third mm -hmm. floor of 20 Ashburton. So I don't know, Kathy, if you have that exact rent for that for that space. Um, I'm looking at the budget allocated to government relations and it's $158,309 allocated to government relations because that would be the Boston office. Very good, thank you. Um, I, another question, line 91, discretionary donations. I noticed there's a request for $70,000. And there's also a, a note requesting to see um, request to see discretionary donations in separate account. Can we um, can we the delegates have some clarity by the time of annual meeting on what these donations are? That seventy thousand dollars is going out in discretionary funds. So I can partly answer this, and maybe Kathy can respond. There was a discussion in the board, um, and to separate out the two lines. There was once one line called all the different donations. Then there was a decision by the board to separate it so that there were ones that were ongoing contributions that we made year to year for, to mass care, to mass trials, citizens for public schools, and then to separate out the discretionary donations that were discretionary um, to the president. So that's what that is. So there's obviously nothing set on what that will be spent on. That has uh, been for, for years, as you know, discretion of the president to to make certain amounts of donations and this was kind of an, a sort of a discussion among a number of people about how to do this and that's what people came up with as a good solution thank you and my last question is how did you determine the need to make 16 organizers permanent employees specifically please list the data or how you arrived at this decision because I was there when we first established it and they were to be temporary employees and I'd like to know the results, the successes, because this sure. is going to be a $4 million expense to our members annually that you're suggesting. Well, it's um, so Eric, there was a, a very long process by which the blueprint project that Lisa Gallatin initiated, many people have participated in various meetings and surveys of all kinds of different parts of our membership, which produced the blueprint, blueprint report, which showed what people wanted most, what our members needed and desired most. And that included much more investment in field resources. And, um, and so out of that came a, a joint labor management committee that Lisa ran um, to look at what's the best way, what's the numbers we would need, what's the best way of organizing them. The result was a proposal that we, that we implemented this year that was voted as part of the budget last year to make those ultimately to those organizers became permanent we now have one more field rep organizer, essentially new field staff in each office, including higher ed. And we have in each office an additional regional organizer. Finally, we also, um, and this came out of the discussions about the kind of support people feel they need for budget, you know, budget campaigns. And um, we have now at staff three people, three former staff for FSO applied for and ultimately were granted this new team of bargaining specialists. So all that together and a new and one additional manager because now there's even more staff to oversee. So this came after like a full eight or nine month process and then has been implemented and we've hired some outstanding people for those positions. I don't know if Lisa, you need to, you would like to comment a little more? Yeah, I just wanna clarify um, uh, one thing in terms of, of um, of this phase one implementation of the blueprint that it was an extensive process of staff interviews, uh, internal uh, learning panels, external panels in which we brought uh, managers and staff from a half dozen or so NEA affiliates from around the country to learn not only best practices, but also learn from the successes and um, failures of different models that had been uh, tried in, in various uh, state affiliates that are similar to, to ours. Um, and to just clarify, the FTT organizer position was eliminated. And what we, uh, we've now uh, renamed our field representatives, field representative organizers, because part of what they do is help with negotiations and contract enforcement support. Um, part of what our field reps do is to help 
uh, recruit and retain and engage and develop leadership among our membership, which is, which is organizing. So the blueprint structure adds a field rep organizer to each of the five regional offices. Those are individuals who like the existing field reps are assigned locals with whom they work exclusively. Um, we also added two field rep organizers permanent positions to the higher ed staff. And then each region now has a new position, a regional organizer. And in addition, we created the bargaining campaign and strategy specialist team. Uh, all of this was brought together in the new field and organizing division. Uh, the, uh, the fruits of this um, blueprint process and the changes we made are already be seen, being seen. Um, I think it's um, pandemic aside, I think it's very exciting. Thank you very much, all of you. Okay, Claire Naughton next. Hi, my question is, I think rather simple, um, I, Claire, could you speak a little closer maybe to the computer? You're a little muffled. How is it now? A little better. All right. Um, during Max's presentation, he put up a lot of information that I don't see any place. I did look in my budget book. I looked in my, in my um, handbook. And I didn't see any of that any place. And I really think it would be good for us to have it, to be able to kind of go over it um, before we look at the budget again. So I wondered if, you know, there's any way to send it out to us so that we can, I took some shots of it, but. Claire, uh, I think, I'd be glad, I think it's be fine. We can get it up on the annual meeting site where there's a number of resources and we could put it up there, that'd be fine. What we were doing is, yes, anyway, we were trying to distill the biggest changes, but more than glad to share that out. Good, I think we should have that, thank you. Sure. Margaret Crow and then Dennis Naughton. So when it came to the numbers um, regarding things uh, like the dues increases, it all seemed to be based on the K-12 sector and their positions. And I wanted to know um, for higher ed where adjuncts and part-time professional staff fall um, you know, on that you know sort of chart of the increases. Great, thanks, Margaret. I think I'm going to ask Kathy. Could you lay that out? How we how we do that, especially for adjuncts and higher ed professional staff. Yeah, it's it's not as simple as that. Some professors work full time, so they could be in the uh, five hundred dollar, three dollar category. But um, I it. Um, you know, if it depends on an adjunct, if they're making under 18,000, then they, I uh, have to look at the, I'd have to look at the dues sheet, but, um, you know, there's too many, there's too many variables with adjuncts. Some of them work more than, more than, uh, teach more than, I don't know how many classes they teach, but there's a, there's a whole range of issues with, um, higher eds and have to look at the dues sheet to, to but, see what but, to, in there, but it okay, would be good to know how those increases um, are going to impact us, though, even if that involves a more complex chart. Great. So why don't we why don't we try to get back to you, Margaret? I mean, the, we should say that that number is that one that you know the the four hundred eighty three, which is the full operating budget dues, that applies for full time active members in in pre K through sixteen. And then, of course, from that, you know, if you're a half time of that, and if you're a faculty member like yourself, and you're and you're half time or part time, then then it goes, um, it's divided up from there. So, but we'll we'll get a hold of more some more details for you, and I'll have that ready on by the by a annual meeting. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Mary. I'd like to just quickly circle back to the uh, blueprint project. Uh, uh, and I have uh, several questions regarding that. And my first one is, was there a written committee report that was issued that's available online? There is a written final report of that blueprint committee. Um, maybe Mary Gilgallon or someone can put a link in the chat at some point during this. Um, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, you know, I, I would also suggest, Max, sorry for interrupting. Um, 
that that actually it would be great to have the the blueprint strategic framework in the annual meeting materials because it's such an important part yep. of the work that we're doing. It really is the strategic priority set by the board that should be guiding the decisions that we make. So maybe we could do that, Mary. And yeah. also just a reminder, we presented it last year at annual meeting and the delegates voted to uh, support it. And it, right. I, it already is on the website, but I think if we move it uh, into the annual meeting section right. as well. Yeah. So I'll, we'll put it tomorrow in the delegate resource section of the annual meeting dashboard. Uh, great, thanks. And thanks. following up on that, um, I, I thought I heard it said that there have been a number of people already hired uh, under that program as organizers. And I was curious to know whether the people who were hired uh, were um, run through the personal selection committee or not. Yes, absolutely. We advertised, they've been did searching since, um, I don't know, all, all through the fall and the winter, various searches for those different positions. Yes. That's good hearing. And finally, um, in, in the actual hires, how many of the people hired were um, already members, working members of the MTA, and how many came from outside? We'll have to get that. I'm trying to, I can't, we can't do it on the top of our head, but. Okay, as long as I can get it, Max, I appreciate it, I understand. Sure. Then Dennis. just, I think I see you <laughs> visually with your hand up. <laughs> Sorry, I missed, the, I missed the how to how to get in the line at okay. the beginning. Um, yeah. I'm just I'm looking through and I'm having a hard time finding the line that includes um, the new member liaison program. I see there's a big expansion to the PALS, but I can't find um, the new members anywhere. Is that included in another line? Um, you know what? I'm trying to remember. Lisa, do you or Kathy, do you know how we dealt with that? Uh, it's in there somewhere. We do not have a separate line for it. I don't, yeah, there's not a separate line. I believe it is so in which, the... So which, which line would it be included in then? It would be part, I believe, I remember discussing this now, part of the, um, in field and organizing, they have an organizing line. That, okay. is, that is where we, we fund a number of our initiatives like that. I see, yeah, so I see the state, 27 state and local organizing and 40 membership recruitment. And I was wondering if it, which, which of those it lived on. State and local organizing. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. All right, and then I see Kyle Jacoby. Thanks, Mary. Um, this feels a little bit like small potatoes, but um, I'm looking at line 14, MTA benefits and miscellaneous income. And a question I have is, does the MTA track enrollment in the MTA benefits programs? Does the, say that once again, Kyle? Does the MTA track enrollment in the various MTA benefits programs? Oh yeah, I mean, that's a big part of what they do. And there's a, there's a board of, the MT, uh, of MTAB, which consists of Mary, Lisa, and myself, as well as a number of members who are elected by the board. They meet, I don't know, do we meet monthly or quarterly? Um, and a lot of that is reviewing how we're doing on the different programs. And, and all awesome. That. And as part of that board, also looking at like a cost benefit analysis of the benefits that are offered versus the benefits to members. Absolutely. That's always, it's an ongoing um, discussion. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Thank you so much. Yeah. There's, thanks, Kyle. Okay. I don't see any more questions. So we will move on now to agenda item number four, the proposed amendments to MTA bylaws and standing rules. And I will introduce Pete Schoonmaker, the chair of the committee. For amendments to the standing rules and the bylaws, we have two proposals for standing rules amendments that have been held over from last year. We have 10 proposals for bylaws amendments, four are holdovers from last year and, uh, sorry, six are holdovers from last year and four are new ones for this year. Uh, the first one we'd like to take up is proposed amendment to the MTA standing rules number one. You will find that on page 21 of your delegate handbook. 
This is submitted by Sue Doherty of Needham, and it is an attempt to get a handle on the yellow cards. As those of you who have attended annual meeting in the past are fully aware, the use, overuse, and abuse of yellow cards has been an incredible amount of time in, involved in conducting the meeting. Going forward, uh, the proposal is that up to five yellow cards will be recognized by the chair. Five points of information will be addressed. Following those five, we will begin a rotation of either red, green, or yellow, or green, red, uh, yellow, depending on which is recognized first. Uh, this will continue until all of the yellow cards have been uh, addressed, at which time we'll continue with the red, green, or green, red progression until more yellow cards are raised, and then we'll go to the previous order, yellow, green, red, or green, yellow, red. Uh, I should point out that we've been using a modified version of this at the Board of Directors for about the last year, and we find that it has been quite effective. The Bylaws and Rules Committee recommends adoption of this standing rule amendment by a vote of six to zero. The 2020 Board of Directors, which is not exactly the same people as the current Board of Directors, recommended adoption by a vote of 42 to 12. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to address them uh, on each item as we go through them. And just for people who might have come late to the meeting in order to uh, get in the queue, go to your reaction button and press the raised hand. And forgive me because I'm gonna have to flow through a bunch of screens. I wonder if I could just ask out loud to Mary Gilgallon, if we can open the chat, it's easier if people put stack. Chief, Max, you can see them if you open participants. Ah, beautiful, There Thank you. you go, yep. Okay, so we've got, I'm gonna just go down the list, Dennis and then Justin. Hi, Peter, uh, I'm just curious, Peter, um, could you characterize the objections raised by the 12 negative votes? Uh, of, from the board of directors? Yeah. Uh, to be honest, Dennis, no, I can't. It was more than a year ago, and I frankly simply don't remember. Well, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. And we have, uh, okay, Justin, and I see Dennis, thanks for lowering your hand. When you're done, definitely lower your, lower your hand. Thanks, Justin. So, uh, thank you. So I'm just looking, and there's talk of the red, green, yellow, green, red, yellow, or if there's no yellows, but what would happen if you had like just greens and yellows on there? Would we still alternate that through or just kind of go with that one green and then end it because there's no other discussion happening? Uh, in, in the situation where we would just have greens and yellows, uh, the chair would, be, would alternate between uh, green and yellow until such time somebody put up a red. Okay. Thank you. Mary, I don't think I see anyone else. Okay, Pete, let's move on. All right. The second amendment proposal for the MTA standing rules is uh, proposed by the MTA Resolutions Committee. It is uh, an amendment to standing rule seven, which addresses specifically the process for which people would submit proposed amendments to resolutions. Uh, about eight years ago, we established a new policy or, or a new process, I should say, that permitted people to submit resolutions requests up to the end of business on the Friday night of annual meeting. Uh, over the past few years, it's become clear that that's rather unwieldy. It is difficult to get the resolutions committee together on short notice. And so the resolutions committee is requesting that we return to the original process wherein people would be required to submit resolutions, amendment proposals by the second week in January. The bylaws and rules committee recommends adoption of this by a vote of six to zero. The 2020 board of directors recommended adoption by a vote of 49 to seven. All right, I don't think there's Any questions. questions. There. Great. Okay, Pete, let's move on. All right, then we move from standing rules amendment proposals to bylaws proposals. 
starting with amendment proposal number one is submitted by the 2020 MTA Executive Committee. The purpose of this is to get information from the locals back to the MTA. Uh, in 2020, the legislature passed a law requiring all municipalities and uh, union employers to submit to the collective bargaining unit an electronic list of all the membership and contact information for that collective bargaining unit in, uh, in electronic format by November 30th of each year. Uh, this information is submitted back to the MTA. It is required by our bylaws that these affiliates, chapters and locals submit that information to the MTA. The only difference here would be that this would now be submitted to the MTA in electronic format rather than uh, other formats. Uh, the, the idea is that whatever file you get from your municipality or employer would simply be forwarded to the MTA by November 30th of each year. The 2020 Bylaws and Rules Committee recommended adoption by a vote of six to zero. The 2020 Board of Directors recommended adoption by a vote of 57 to zero. Okay, Very no questions. Great. Okay, let's go to the next one. Very good. The next one is brought to you by Carrie Costello. It is uh, an amendment to bylaw article 11, section 1A. And it adds a clause that says members and affiliates that willfully fail to comply with MTA policies shall be subject to admonishment, censure, or suspension. I think that's pretty straightforward and uh, easy to understand. The 2020 Bylaws and Rules Committee recommended rejection of this amendment proposal by a vote of six to zero. The 2020 Board of Directors recommended rejection of this proposal by a vote of 32 to 25. There are no questions, Mary. Right, Pete, go ahead. Bylaw amendment. Is, I'm sorry to time. interrupt there actually, Max, there is a question. Adeline B. Go ahead, Adeline. Hi, uh, Pete. Could you please explain to us why um, this was voted uh, down or rejected based on the fact that over the years we've had a number of issues with this and we have absolutely no teeth, so it continues to happen at times? The, the debate of the committee centered around the idea that most, uh, at least some of the policies have penalties and processes involved with the individual policies. And that if someone objected to the way a particular policy was being enforced, that the, the best process would be to submit an amendment to that policy, putting some teeth into enforcement of that particular policy. Thank you. Okay, Pete, go ahead. All right, we're on bylaw amendment proposal number three. It was submitted by the 2020 Task Force on Progressive Dues Structure. It would affect bylaw article four, section 2A, and has to do with the dues from active members. Uh, what this does is it gives locals and chapters the ability to structure their own dues within the, the strictures of MTA's assessment for the chapter or local as a whole. So each chapter or local has an amount that they are required to remit to MTA on a yearly basis. How they assemble that amount of money is would be up to them. So if they wanted to give certain members a break and subsidize that break by increasing the dues on their other members, that would be a local decision rather than an MTA decision. The bylaws and rules committee recommended adoption by a vote of six to zero. The 2020 board of directors recommended adoption by a vote of 46 to 10. Okay, 
All right. And you know the one, great. All right, Pete, go ahead to the next one, please. Bylaws amendment proposal number four was also submitted by the task force on progressive dues structure. And it is a recognition of the issue where there are members whose employment falls somewhere between 50% and full-time. Uh, the idea here was to give at least a small break to folks who are say 0.75 if they have a, a full-time equivalent due structure that is somewhere between 50% and 80%, they would pay 75% of the annual dues of a full-time equivalent. The Bylaws and Rules Committee recommends adoption by a vote of six to zero. The 2020 Board of Directors recommended adoption by a vote of 51 to two. Okay, hey, no hands. hands. Great. All right, Pete, let's keep going. Thank you. Right. Bylaws amendment number five also affects Article 4, Section 2A, which is the, the due structure. And this is another attempt to give folks a little bit of a break here and there. And it was the idea that uh, I'm, I apologize. I have, I have given the justifications in the wrong order. Uh, the previous bylaw was uh, identified not for uh, based on the amount of time people worked, but the amount of the year that they worked. So it was 75% of the year rather than 50% of the year. This one is the one where it's someone who is somewhere between 0.5 and 0.8 but the, the general idea and the results are approximately the same. The, uh, the bylaws and rules committee recommended adoption by a vote of seven to zero and the board of directors recommended adoption by a vote of 54 to zero. All right, Pete, go ahead. Very good. Bylaws amendment proposal number six also affects article four, section 2A. And this amendment would change the criterion by which dues are assessed. Currently, we begin assessing dues on members at the time of their employment. The task force on progressive dues structure suggested that it might be helpful to base the initial dues paid by a member based on their enrollment date rather than, than on their employment date. Uh, this was supposed to be particularly effective in higher ed positions, wherein somebody might be hired halfway through the year and then be presented with a bill for the, the entire year up to that point based on the, the date that they were hired. Uh, the enrollment date is a situation where people would begin paying dues when they are enrolled rather than when they begin employment. There will be some effect on dues. It's unclear exactly how much this will affect the MTA's dues income, but the thought was that if we can get people to enroll and not face a big dues bill on their enrollment date, it's much more likely that we'll pick up folks who would otherwise choose to sit the year or perhaps their entire careers out without paying union dues at all. Uh, the bylaws and rules committee recommended adoption by a vote of five to two. The board of directors recommended adoption by a vote of 47 to one. Sorry, Dennis. Uh, yeah, Dennis. Sorry, just a quick question overall on, on thinking about the last few proposals. Uh, when so when the FTE was calculated, was this taken into consideration in any way? Uh, I don't know. That'd be a question for Max. I think Max or Kathy. Yeah. So we did not calculate in the various bylaws, not knowing whether they were gonna pass or not. And as you can, as you heard from Pete, 
uh, it's not clear how much we would gain or lose. I mean, there's there's a loss on one hand, but as Pete was just saying, there's a possibility that, that members join because they feel like this is a fair way to do it in their um, way, way to fair way to do do. So we did not incorporate that into our into our uh, budget proposal. Okay, thanks. Okay, Pete, please continue. Uh, you've got a hand. Oh, yeah, uh, Diana. Martin. Diana, okay. Hi, Hi. Diana. Hello, how you doing, Pete? Um, quick question. My concern when I listen to this is, and I'm wondering how this would be handled, um, if people m might decide not to enroll until they have a problem. Um, I'm yes. worried, would, would something like this perhaps cause someone to say, hey, you know, um, I don't need to join all the time because if I get in trouble, I can join when that happens. Uh, yes. Yes and no. Uh, first of all, yes, it was a concern. Uh, it was a concern that was raised during the debate amongst the, the committee. And in fact, it's the reason why a couple of folks voted against this. Uh, the idea of free riders is, is something that's always a concern. The majority of the committee felt that giving folks the opportunity to enroll without having a big dues, dues bill would be more of an incentive to get them on board. I should point out that they can only free ride for a year this way, that uh, their enrollment date would be uh, at the beginning of the following school year, regardless of what their employment date is. This is only for new active members. Okay, thank you. And um, Sarah Mabrook. Hi, I just wanted to say that I think that's a very nice idea in terms of folks who are part-time. That's all, no question. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, Pete, I think that was it for, these, for this, ish, this item. Okay, then we move on to bylaws amendment number seven, which also affects article four, section 2A. This is submitted by Sherry Horianopoulos and CJ O'Donnell. And it is again, like, like the three previous proposals, an effort to make things a little bit easier on folks who wish to uh, join the, the MTA and become dues paying members. The idea of this one is that especially for higher ed members uh, who are hired throughout the year, not necessarily based on a, a quarter of the year as it is with mostly with pre-K pre to 12, members. Uh, it would prorate their dues based on which month they begin employment. Now, I, I should point out a couple of important things about this particular amendment. Were we to adopt bylaws amendment proposal number six, the, uh, the date of dues assessment would begin on enrollment. If we were to then to go forward and adopt number seven, the uh, employment date would go back, to the, the date of dues uh, assessment would go back to the employment rather than the enrollment date. So this means in order to avoid overwriting, if you will, amendment number six, there would have to be an amendment from the floor for number seven to keep it from overwriting amendment number six. The other thing that I want to highlight is based on information that has come to light since the bylaws and rules committee met, there is going to be a certain amount of difficulty associated with implementing this. I had a, a long conversation with Kathy Conway a few weeks ago. And according to Kathy, the, there's going to be something around a $68,000 drop in dues revenue predicted for adoption of this amendment, but it would also require a substantial amount of increase in staff time and also local officer time, because when folks are hired this way, it means that they have to have their information entered manually. And this involves a, a certain number of codes applied to the member. A According to Kathy, the number of codes that people would have to pay attention to would go up from 12 to 132. So there's concern that this would 
cause more confusion at the staff level, but more importantly, at the level of the local or chapter treasurer. Uh, based on the information that we had at the time, the bylaws and rules committee voted to recommend adoption by a vote of six to one. The board of directors voted to recommend rejection of this amendment by a vote of 35 to 17. Okay, Mary, we have several people. Uh, start with Phyllis Newfeld. Hi, Phyllis. Go ahead, Phyllis. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Phyllis, go ahead. Okay. Um, I have a two-part question. Was there any move or an attempt by your committee to have the makers of this motion aware of the change in the last one and to work together? is the first part and this. Okay, can, can I answer the first part first then? Sure. Uh, the first part of the question, the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, I did personally reach out to the, the makers of each amendment and requested them to work together to come up with something that was mutually agreeable. Uh, the, the submitters of the two proposals agreed to disagree and submitted their own separate proposals. Okay. What's your second question? Was there any talk about divisiveness that might be created between K, you know, pre-K to 12 and then higher ed if the due structure is so different? Uh, I'm not aware of any, any discussion. There's, there was not any discussion of that problem at the bylaws and rules committee. Thank you. Okay, next is Sherry Horianopoulos. Go ahead, Sherry. I just wanted to bring up a point that um, at the beginning of this presentation about the meeting, you said there would be no arguments pro or con uh, on these presentations. And I'm a little bit disappointed that you've just spent, and I know you did it on the other uh, pre-convention meeting too, you spent a bunch of time explaining why this was a bad idea. And I feel like that should probably not have been done here in the pre-convention meeting. It kind of sets a tone where this is going to fail. And there's probably very good arguments that could be made at town at the annual meeting so that each side could present their case. Um, yes, I, I, I understand your concern about that. I should point out, and, and I, I wanna be clear on this. Uh, the information that I am presenting is not my opinion. It is not the opinion of the bylaws and rules committee. This is information that we were provided by staff and is relevant to the, the discussion of the amendment. And this information is provided, as you can see in the impact statement, and will be thoroughly discussed on the floor of the annual meeting. Okay, one more. Adeline, Go ahead, Adeline. Yeah, hi guys. Um, I'm, I'm sort of perplexed over the um, these two amendments, um, these two proposals. Could you tell me what teeth we have in it or uh, somewhere else, anywhere else that would stop someone from becoming a, um, an educator on September 1st, let's say, and looking at this and saying, I don't wanna be a member today. I'm gonna to join after April 15th or doing it like for another year? Is there something that says, okay, you've already been, been a member, you've been employed for a year, now you have to, the following year, you would have to start in September. Is there anything anywhere that would help us with that? Post Janice, uh, basically no. Uh, basically, uh, members of a collective bargaining unit can opt in or they can opt out the efforts here, the, the all four of these amendments are efforts to make things just a little bit easier folks to make the decision to opt in rather than to opt out. And Mary, if I could just ask a question since there's no one else on, just ask Pete yeah. about the discussion. Um, there, because the, people were concerned that someone would say, you know, I'm not gonna join, but when I need it, I'll join. But theoretically, um, if you don't join and something happens, uh, you're not a member at that moment. And uh, there is a choice about whether a local would choose to actually uh, help, uh, assist a non-member in, in certain uncertain ways that are not covered um, normally by the collective bargaining. Is that right? Yes. 
Okay, okay Mary, so I don't see anyone else on this one. Great, Pete, let's go to eight. Proposed bylaw amendment proposal number eight is submitted by the credentials and ballot committee. It affects bylaw article seven, section six C and has to do with the election of the uh, statewide retired board of directors candidates. Uh, currently, there is no language that indicates whether this election should be conducted or, or decided by majority or plurality. What this amendment does is it definitely comes down on the side of majority. This makes the statewide retired directors elections consistent with the elections of the other district directors elections. The bylaws and rules committee recommends adoption by a vote of seven to zero. The MTA board of directors recommends adoption by a vote of 52 to zero. Hey, Mary, we have Lois Powers and then Dennis Taunton. Okay, go ahead, Lois. Oh, thank you very much, Mary. Hello, everybody. Um, I, this is not in regard to the um, bylaw you just read, Pete, or the proposal, I should say, but this is in regard to the, the general um, conversation that we've been, well, the, the listening to you um, say. But, um, I mean, for instance, a moment ago, you mentioned that um, these things would be thoroughly discussed at annual meeting. And I, I guess I'm, I'm just wanting to express my concern regarding that thoroughly discussed because I, you know, when I'm reading the special rules um, in our handbook, I see that delegates have one minute, um, you know, for a thorough discussion. Um, and also, you know, all of the, the, I understand that there need to be time restraints, um, especially due to the fact that we're, we're in a Zoom meeting, but I do have, you know, a big concern about these, um, num the number of minutes that are allocated to many of these important matters that we're gonna be discussing. I don't know if that's something that can be addressed when we open annual meeting, um, you know, perhaps to, I, I don't know how to go about it if we ask to extend the time or something, but um, it is a very big concern to me that we're restricting ourselves, um, you know, to, to a relatively small amount of time for some very big decisions. So I just wanted to um, get that out there. And if somebody can suggest to me um, if there's a way for us to perhaps um, it, you know, change that, uh, I'd, I'd be very happy to pursue it. Uh, I'm just not sure how to go about it, to be honest. Um, but I would like to get sure. it out there that there's I'm, a problem I'm, I'm in happy my to, opinion. I'm happy to help you with that. Uh, at you. the beginning of the, the Friday session at annual meeting, we will be adopting the special rules for this meeting and we will be able to amend those rules if that is the will of the body and pete let me just add to that too um i i think the uh committee worked incredibly hard to anticipate a lot of different problems that could come up not i think i know they did uh, the standing rules were developed in consultation with jim slaughter our parliamentarian who has now run many, many annual meetings uh, with all of, with many NEA affiliates. And he's brought to the table the things that he's learned. And if, if you all look at special rule number 20, um, it says if there are speakers in the queue when the item, uh, when the item time allotted has been reached, a vote shall be taken on whether to extend debate an additional five minutes. A two thirds vote is required to extend the time. So what that means is if there are people still in the queue at the end of the allotted time, um, the body, I, I pose to the body if the body wants to extend the debate. Uh, if there continues to be for five minutes, if there continues to be more people in the queue, uh, we, we continue to vote on whether the body wants to extend the conversation or not. So that's a second way 
to address it. And I am always going back to the inner Steve Gorey in my head, <laughs> who one of the first things he said to me when he trained me on uh, parliamentary procedures is that the meeting belongs to the body. So it's my job to put questions to you on how you would like to proceed when we come to points that people are feeling uh, we should do something differently, extend time, et cetera. Mary, we've got Dennis Naughton next. Yep. Yes, uh, actually, I was going to uh, say something much like what Lo Lois said. Um, and what I'm about to say is no way meant to be personal, uh, personally critical, but I do feel that at last year's meeting, there was an awful lot of time, in my mind, the word would be squandered, uh, on things that are less important than the true business that is before the annual meeting. Um, I think that the uh, people who are presiding at the meeting at any given time should always be cognizant of whether or not they need to go on about something that can be said briefly. I think that when it comes to the celebratory kinds of things that we do, those are less important than doing the business that we're talking about here tonight. And so I feel as though in crafting the one minute amount of time, that wasn't given due consideration. And it shouldn't be left to the body to try to change the rule that should have been put into place to begin with. Uh, so Dennis, what there I- There is an avenue to do that, uh, but uh, I don't think that we should have had to use that avenue if anybody wants to do that. That's yeah, my Dennis honest opinion, and I hope you'll take it in the sense that it is meant. It's meant to be constructive and to focus on why we're really at annual meeting. Yeah, Dennis, Thank you, Dennis. I, I hear what you're saying. And let me just tell you that in reflecting on each annual meeting uh, and the, the first virtual annual meeting, uh, we, the, uh, the, the group that put the agenda together uh, and the various committees took a lot of that into consideration to figure out what is the most essential business that we have to get to. Uh, the, we made a presentation to the board. The board voted on the agenda as you see it. When you look at things like the award, remember many of these things are built into current standing rules. So we have to have awards. We have to have awards according to the standing rules in certain uh, places in the actual meeting. And so we've done things to try to minimize things like the awards by not having the awardees give speeches, but just present the awards to them and their speeches will be on video. So we did look as carefully and as closely as we can to figure out how to maximize the time. Um, and Dennis, what I would say to you is the, the, the meeting does belong to the body not to the presider. And it is appropriate for the body to stop at different points and make decisions about how to continue forward with parts of the meeting. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how it works. We were very careful and very thoughtful um, and tried to anticipate and learn lessons from other affiliates. Just as a quick note, Mary, before we just call on Claire, just to, as an example, the issues forum, which is usually an hour will be 20 minutes um, there will be no speeches from various award winners. There's pre-recorded speeches that will be online. We'll acknowledge people, but point people to the website. And leadership reports will be shortened. So in all, all kinds of ways, I think people uh, really, the, the group that put that together really heard all that. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Uh, and I, I will personally take what you've, you've said to heart. Claire, go ahead. And, uh, Claire Naughton. Claire, you're muted. I know. Okay, what... I'm going to lean forward just in case you can't hear me. It just seemed that, and and I'm going to say yes, it is. It is the body. It is our meeting, but it is up to leadership to make sure that people stay on task. And it seemed to me that last year, when we were speaking to issues, there were people that came on and used up the time, who were not speaking to what we were speaking about at the time, but kind of going on and doing praising of this and that. And it really is up to the leadership to make sure that we stay on task and that we speak 
to the issue. So I hope that that, that will be done this year. And I hope that I'm not, it was the first time we did that. I can, I can see things like that happening, but let's clean it up this year if we can. Thanks, Claire. Uh, again, I, I will personally do everything I can to move things along. Okay, Pete, let's go to the next. Yes, yeah, speaking uh, of moving things along, go ahead. <laughs> uh, proposed amendment to the bylaws number nine is also submitted by the MTA credentials and ballot committee. Uh, this would affect article seven, section 3D4 and refers to the election of the at-large ESP executive committee member. The current, uh, current bylaw language is actually contradictory. In one part, it says the candidate receiving the highest number of votes shall be declared elected, which implies a, plural, a plurality. It, uh, but on the other hand, there's a process involved that ensures a majority. So what the MTA credentials and ballot committee has done is revised the bylaw or recommended a revision to the bylaw in order that the ESP executive committee member would be elected by a majority and a process put in place by which a majority would be ensured. And as with the previous amendment, this is done in order to be consistent with the election of the other executive committee members. The bylaws and rules committee recommends adoption by a vote of six to zero. The board of directors recommends adoption by a vote of 55 to zero. Okay, I don't think there's any comments or questions. So Pete, go ahead to the next, please. Then we come to proposed bylaw amendment number 10, which would affect bylaws article one, which is the name of the organization. This is submitted by Jahira Rodriguez, and she would propose that we change the name of our organization from the Massachusetts Teachers Association to the Massachusetts Educators Association. And I want to recognize Jahira because she is a member of my committee and she put forward a, a very thorough and reasoned argument behind changing the name from teachers to educator. The issue that we're going to run into is that this involves a great deal more than amending one item in the bylaws. If you look at the impact statement on page 32, you will see that there are four very large items that need to be dealt with. And I assure you that those are just the highlights. Uh, we had a long conversation with general counsel Rebecca Yee, who's done a great deal of hard work on this in order to establish exactly what would be involved. She uh, presented to us information about the name change, a similar name change made by the Maryland Teachers Association, who are now the Maryland Educators Association, and told us that it took something well over a million dollars in funds and about five years to get the job done. Uh, the suggestion going forward is that either this amendment will be withdrawn or it will be ruled out of order from the chair. And in any case, it will be replaced by a new business item, which will have the same effect, but give both staff and the leadership the time they need to get this done properly, correctly, and right. The, I, I should say that based on the recommendation of, uh, or the presentation by Jahira, the bylaws and rules committee recommended adoption by a vote of seven to zero. There was a very strong feeling on the committee that this was the right thing to do. And we still feel that way. We just need to make sure that we get the time and funds needed to get this done correctly. Uh, the MTA Board of Directors voted to take no position on this by a vote of 38 to 21. <clears> hey, <throat> okay. Mary, I'd actually like to start with Jahira since she is here and raising her hand. Jahira? Yes, please do. Jahira, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, Pete, thank you. I really appreciate your words. 
I do want to mention that when I submitted this bylaw, I was aware of all the implication that it would take. I will never do nothing to jeopardize our union as I work very hard and I believe that is, it's, it's, it's what we do as educators. So when I heard about the impact, I had decided to have a plan B and that plan B is to have a new business item. This new business item um, does explain a lot of creating a task force, um, giving a three year, not only to MTA, but us as well to be prepared for this, to have a democratic process where everybody, each member have the opportunity to choose a name that is going to be inclusive, not only, um, and also another, thing is to acknowledge that this is an educator union. This is not Massachusetts Teacher Association because it's only teachers. There's a lot of people that is important when it comes to the education of our students and also the structure of this union. This year, more than ever, ESP has been in the board, um, our, our side, uh, making sure that our schools are proper funded, that our students have everything they need. And this is because ESPs believe in education. I don't know how much you know about our paycheck, but it is not um, a paycheck that is reasonable for educators. So we're in education because we love what we do. Um, MTA had changed drastically since the leadership of Mary and Max and we had tried to, and we talk about inclusivity and what better way to make sure that the name includes every member, every paying member of this union. So I'm asking you to not focus in that MTA have been called MTA for 175 years, but to focus that it is time that we change, that it is time that we could that we actually talk about inclusivity. This is also, also included in racial and social justice. Names are important. Um, and I'm asking to, to this membership to understand why this name needs to change. Um, people People have looked for us in other space, look up to MTA because we always try to do the best we can. So I'm asking you to think about it. It is time that we include every paying member and this unit should not be called MTA. So um, thank you very much everybody for your attention. And if, if you have any questions, I'm here and I will see you Thanks, Jahira. guys on Friday. So we got a bunch of people. Let's start with Marianne Ziemba. Hi, Marianne. Hi, Pete. Um, and thank you, Yahara, for um, further explaining. I appreciate that. Um, I guess I still have a couple of questions. Um, first, um, so is there an intent of the Yahara for you to, re to remove this bylaw after speaking to it? Or are you- um, one, of, one of two things will happen. It will either be ruled out of order from the chair or it will be withdrawn. Okay. Okay, all right, thank you for that clarification. And my next and final question is, uh, so the NBI, um, do we have a rough idea how much like of a cost that will come or if the cost, like is we, there- we really, we really don't at this point, but uh, Rebecca Yee let us know that uh, when Marilyn did this, it cost them somewhere around a million and a half dollars. But the other thing to remember too, so for this year, the NBI does not have any money. Part of the task force is to study the overall expense. And given that it's a multi-year process, um, the, it, the cost of it will be uh, phased in year by year as the task force understands better what has to be paid for each year. And it doesn't necessarily lead to a dues increase. There's, there's other ways uh, to, to build it in. Uh, Mary, may I request that once the NBI is finalized that you send me a copy so that I can be a little better informed in making these presentations? Mary, I think we can do that. Absolutely. All the NBIs are going to be on the website soon. Um, they're just coming in and we're in the process of processing them and I need to get them onto the website and I anticipate doing that by, you know, Thursday at the latest. Okay. Um, Eric Champy and then Adeline B. Yes. Hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. Hi. Hi. Thank you. My, there we go. I'm unmuted. Hello, Pete. Thank you very much. And I appreciate Jahira explaining her, um, her proposal to us. I have two questions and I, well, part of it was answered. Um, Maryland does have 75,000 members. We have 115,000 members. This would be very costly to make this change. But my question is, and I wonder if Rebecca Yee 
answered it. Do we have to have all members, not just annual meeting participants, vote on it? Because we were incorporated 175 years ago in Worcester as the Massachusetts Teachers Association. So would that be an all member vote as opposed to just the annual meeting delegates of which are represent less than 1% of our membership? My understanding is that that would require a, a vote of the entire membership. Entire membership. Um, on. It's ac well, actually, it's if I could jump in. Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Little, what we have learned is that it's a little different. Sta uh, state law requires that um, our board create a process for voting on changing the name in our articles of incorporation. So that process could be a vote of the entire membership, but because we vote uh, for the uh, MTA largely through our delegate, delegate assembly, it would also be considered within the spirit and intent of the law to have it be a vote of the uh, delegates of the annual meeting. So that, that's a decision per state statute that the board will be making as part of the process that the task force will research and then develop. Thank you. Hey, Adeline B is next. Hi, um, I, I wanna thank Jahara for doing this. I happen to agree with her. I think this needs to be done. This just isn't the way, obviously um, you've said it will either be withdrawn or it will be ruled out of order. Would it be possible to have a list of what it would take and, and the length of time it would take for members, because I think the majority of our members will probably agree with this, this does need to be done. I think we need to know, and even in this discussion, it seems like there's a lot of people who aren't really sure exactly which step comes first, second, third, and what Lisa just said, we're not even sure how it would be finalized um, and voted on. But my concern is also that whatever we do, we don't put a bylaw or put anything into place that we have to implement within a year or two years because it's something that's going to take um, much longer due to contracts, if nothing else, with all of our members, um, all of our locals. Um, and that's at least a, a three year rotating process, if not longer, depending on, on the local. So if there's a way to actually list for the annual meeting what it would take and you know the, the actual steps and possibly get some sort of an idea of how much it would cost. There's parts of this that we can cost out. Um, I think that will be extremely helpful for all of our members. So Adeline, a lot of, a large part of what you just described is actually the charge of the task force. There's, we have some preliminary information, but that's why we're calling to put together a task force to examine everything that has to go on and lay out a process. So we will not have a full accounting for the delegates. Um, that will be, we will put the task force together immediately so that we can get information compiled and out as soon as reasonable. So you're, Amiri, you're saying that the task force will go into place after annual meeting. Would they have a timeline included? Yeah, uh, the, the new business, you will see when the new business comes out that it does detail uh, these things. It details their task, the, the composition, their timeline, et cetera. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Nancy Caswell. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I don't want to take up a lot of time. This isn't actually about um, Jahira's bylaw. I just wanted to ask if it's possible for you guys to explain why we can't use iPads versus computers for annual meeting, because that was a little confusing to me. Because like my husband has a iPad and we bought it because he can't zoom on his Mac because his Mac is too old. So is it a different thing that we're using, not zoom? Um, yes, Nancy. It, it, there is. It's a platform called Lumi, and it's not compatible with those types of devices. And it was one of the things that this platform is enabling us to do the debate and to conduct the meeting the way we want to. So we had to make the decision to go with that. But will it be, um, 
is it going to be acceptable if you have an older model computer? Is it any computer you can use? Or does it have to be a certain year? We should do the test on Wednesday and make sure. OK, thank you very much. I think the last person I see his hand up is Dennis Naughton. Go ahead, Dennis. Just a quick question uh, to you, Lisa. Uh, when you describe the, you know, uh, how it might have to be handled, the statewide vote versus annual meeting, uh, what the mechanism would be, um, was that based on a written legal opinion from MTA legal division? This is, this is actually a perfect example, Dennis, of why we can't rush this process. Because as our general counsel began to research what would be required in order to change our name, what she learned is that before we can change our bylaws, there is this first step of changing the name in the Articles of Incorporation. So yes, uh, uh, it was a legal opinion, it was, um, uh, developed in consultation with the Secretary of State's office. It's just one of many complicated hoops that we'll have to jump through in order to um, follow through on this process. We can absolutely do it. Uh, we need to make sure we do it right. And we need to make sure we do it in a way um, that does not uh, put the MTA or any of our locals at risk. And that's why the idea of the NBI that Jahaira has talked about that creates through uh, uh, ongoing consultation with our general counsel and with other state affiliates and with appropriate uh, state uh, decision makers uh, and lawmakers, we will create a process where we can do this change in a way that um, works for everybody. Well, thank you. And uh, we'll let, uh, is that written opinion available to the membership on the website? I don't, uh, I don't know, Dennis, that it's a written opinion. This has been a, um, a very robust back and forth between uh, the bylaw committee and Jahaira and other members of the ESP committee and our both general counsel and deputy general counsel. So again, the part of the task force will be to finalize all of these findings and opinions and recommendations. Thank you very much. Hey, Mary, we have one more. Um, Maritha Wallace. Hi, um, Jahira, thank you so much for putting this out um, there. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to, to, to ask, is it easier to add something to a title that's already there rather than reinventing the wheel? I'm just asking because I figured I should know that. Um, and the reason why I asked, because does that mean that, that this could be incorporated immediately? No, any change to the name requires all of this rigmarole. Got it, thank you so much. You're welcome. So that looks like the end of questions and that was the last uh, bylaw to go through. So we will move on next to someone's May trying I, to get uh, your attention you've got somebody trying to to get hi in. my name is regina simons uh triton high school for some reason i have all reactions but a raised hand so i'm i'm just raising in this way the i i hear you um you hira and i really appreciate what you have to say my concern about using the term educator or educators association is doesn't when we're speaking of educators doesn't that include administration as well and um aren't we a teachers association here to work together and and ensure what's best for our teachers and i i do understand that we we need to think of our IAs um, as well, but maybe there's a better term for it. So because... Regina, I'm, I'm gonna pause you for a couple of minutes because now we're just entering into debate. This is the kind of thing to bring up at annual meeting if you're going to speak in favor or against. And also I think part of the new business item people will see is that the task force creates a process for how the body 
on a whole deliberates on what the name is. So it isn't necessarily the same that Jahida proposed from the beginning. So thank you. Uh, now, Sarah Mabruk. I just wanted to say thank you for all the thoughtful work that's gone into this, especially Jahira and all of you, because it's very impressive and very um, appreciated. I think it's nice and especially the inclusivity. So no debate, just something. That's just a thank you. <laughs> thank <laughs> Thanks, you, Sarah. Thanks, and if in the same spirit, Mary, if, if I may take a moment to thank the members of the Bylaws and Rules Committee, they put in a lot of extra work this year, and I personally appreciate it. I'd also like to say thank you, as always, to Mary Gilgallon and John Connolly, and also uh, Kathy Conway and Rebecca Yee put in a lot of work helping us get things done this year. So I'm grateful to all of those. Thank you, Peter. And I, I echo that sentiment. Can we not the... forget Mary Gilgallon? Um, because Mary had, e like, since I started the process, there's not one time that I email and she doesn't email big back. She helped me to resource and then she had helped me with the MBI. So I don't want us to forget about Mary Gagelin, which I'm very appreciative. Yes, indeed. I second that too. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on now to agenda item number five, the proposed resolutions. Tom Estabrook, who's a member of the committee is going to present. So welcome, Tom. Thank you. Um, so our committee, um, we've got about eight people on the committee um, and we're also supported by Laura Barrett and Janice Morrissey from uh, MTA staff. Laura Barrett, I believe is uh, retiring. Uh, so I wanted to thank her for her good work over the last few years that I've been on the committee. Um, so um, in general, so resolutions are statements uh, of principle, and they can be used by the leadership um, when MTA needs to take a public position on, on, on an issue. Um, and they're voted on, resolutions are voted on and amended by the entire body at, at annual meeting. Um, this year, because we have, um, uh, you know, it's a different structure uh, than uh, a normal in-person meeting, annual meeting, we'll have limited time to debate the amendments to resolutions. And it's similar to the bylaws. So it's, um, we're not gonna have um, a lot of time to, to um, tinker with, with the resolution. So the proposed changes um, that we have to resolutions were presented to the board of directors last year. Uh, and again, this year. Um, and um, so specific for this year, we've got, um, they're listed in the, uh, the pamphlet, the annual meeting pamphlet, the, the resolutions. Uh, they're listed numerically, but they're gonna be presented in two groups. And so the first group of, uh, these are changes that were uh, amendments uh, that were made by uh, the committee, uh, the LGBTQ committee uh, by Eric Fearing. And uh, they were meant to amend the language in to make them more inclusive and not to kind of like change the resolutions substantively. Uh, so just to make them more inclusive. And there in that grouping, there are 19 resolutions uh, that have been uh, adjusted to be more inclusive. Um, I'm not gonna really get into those other than just say, I mean, they're, they, they cover a lot of ground. A number of them have to do with health uh, they have to do with uh, the foster care, rights of the child, child labor, pay equity. So they, it's quite a span. Uh, the other group of resolutions uh, is where uh, substantive changes were made. Um, and so these uh, proposed changes came from individual members and the committee, the resolutions committee approved uh, the changes. Um, so there are six resolutions in that category, and they include things like um, equal opportunity and extracurricular programs, benefits of recess, appointment of coaches, compensation for substitutes, and equitable support for collective bargaining. Um, so th this is what's coming up at annual meeting. And they'll be voted on in, in terms of kind of like these groups that I mentioned, these groups of resolutions, one that 
makes the resolutions more inclusive, but they don't, they don't really change the nature of the re resolution. Uh, and the other that actually involve um, substantive changes. So are there any questions? I see Peggy in my window. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Peggy. Peggy, you're on mute. Very quick question and suggestion. I read resolution uh, C3 and I said to myself, gender identity or expression. What is expression? I said, I read through the rest of the book and the rest of the book called it gender identity or expression. So my strong suggestion for clarity and consistency is to take out that comma. Did, did I make myself clear? Yes. Good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's That's amazing the power that a comma has <laughs> or the <laughs> absence of a comma has. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Thanks, Love Peggy. Peggy, let's talk about the Oxford comma sometime, okay? <laughs> Max's favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anyone else, Mary, on the, at the moment. Okay. Good. So we can move on to agenda item number six. Uh, this is an opportunity to hear from candidates for the MTA offices. As always, delegates vote in contested elections at annual meeting. And this year, the only contested elections are for board seats 14D, 28D, 19G, and seats on the retired members committee. So only the delegates from these districts will be voting in the elections this year. So we'll hear from the candidates. The speeches are timed by members of the bylaws and the rules committee and the time limit is three minutes. So for candidates who are speaking, the clock will start whenever you're ready. So whenever you start talking is when our timers will uh, run the clock. Be sure to unmute yourselves when you are introduced and the members of the bylaws and rules committee will be timing the speeches, but giving you a 15 second warning. So is that going to be Pete and Ben again, or just Ben? Yes, as, as we did last time, I will be doing the timing for the board of directors and Ben will be doing it for the retiree candidates. Okay, great. So, so we will start first with the district 14 D candidate for board of director. Uh, we have two candidates, but only one has asked to speak tonight and that is Nancy clarity. So Nancy, as soon as you're ready, you can unmike and speak. Hi, good evening. Hi, my name is Nancy Clority, and I've been teaching ESL at Woodrow Wilson Elementary School in Framingham for 10 years. I decided to become an ESL teacher after living in Mexico for six years. I always tell people that Mexico is one of the best places to learn Spanish. Most Mexicans will talk with you and be patient with you while you are learning Spanish. They welcome you to their country and society. This experience opened my eyes to how differently immigrants are treated here in the United States, especially if they don't yet speak English. This made me want to become an ESL teacher to welcome immigrants to the United States as I had been welcomed in Mexico and to help students acquire English in order to find their own academic and professional success in this country. 10 years later, I still very much love teaching and I love my students. But as my school went into a turnaround plan four years ago, I have become very disillusioned and frustrated. The pressure to raise test scores, the lack of respect for educators' knowledge and professionalism, the micromanaging and crushing workload have led to constant staff turnover and have also negatively impacted our students. As if the frustrations with top-down mandates and the lack of respect for educators weren't enough, this school year, 
We have truly seen how little our leaders in local, state, and federal government value our work and our lives. From sending us back into unsafe buildings without universal COVID testing or vaccines, to attacking our unions and us as educators, those in power have shown us just how little we can trust them to look out for our best interests. So it has to be within our union, with every member's voice, participation, and collective action, that we will return control of our public schools to educators, parents, and the community. I ask for your vote for the MTA Board of Directors so that I can be a voice fighting for respect for educators, for respect for our lives and well being, for an end to the high stakes testing system, and for economic, racial, and social justice for all of our educators, our students, and our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, now we will move on to candidate for Board of Directors, District 28D. Again, there's two candidates, but tonight only Donna Grady has signed up to speak. So Donna, you can unmute. And when you start, the clock will start. Thank you, Mary. Hi, colleagues and delegates. My name is Donna Grady, and I'm here to ask for your vote for re-election to the Board of Directors. I'm currently the president of Franklin, and I'm also a kindergarten teacher there. Respectful communication and advocacy for members has always been my top priority. Listening to the needs of members, locals, and chapters will unite and strengthen not only our profession, but also our larger union. It will help all members to realize their full potential as one voice, one body working together in advocacy, service, and organizing for all. As a director, it's my role, should I be reelected, to connect the smaller locals to the larger association for each to benefit from the other. I'm a good communicator, I listen, I share what you need, and I research and question when needed. Again, I ask for your vote to be the voice of the members. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Donna. Okay, we will move next to the candidate for board director district 19G. We have two candidates running, each will be speaking tonight. I'd first like to introduce Daphne Balan. And Daphne, go ahead and unmic and as soon as you start, the clock will start. Is Daphne here? Actually check the list. We don't actually see Daphne registered. So we'll go on to Bobby Travers. Bobby, Thank are you, you Mary? Okay, you're welcome, Bobby. Uh, my name is Bobby Travers, a paraprofessional from Cambridge, and I'm asking for your vote to be your district director on the MTA Board of Directors. It would be an honor for me to serve in this capacity and represent the members of the Cambridge Education Association, Somerville Educators Union, Chelsea Administrators, and the Cambridge Safety and Security Specialists. I will be a strong, knowledgeable, and passionate public education advocate and will communicate the needs of our members, schools, and students. I feel my skill set, experience, and personal background make me an excellent candidate. Having served on the MTA Executive Committee and Board of Directors previously, I know what is needed to be an effective member of the MTA Board. During these challenging times, we must ensure that we are stronger and organized, that we are electing pro-education candidates and passing pro-education legislation, including the elimination of high stakes testing, paid family medical leave for all public employees. We must strive to gain social justice and equity for all in education and in our communities. These goals are what makes MTA a necessary and vital organization. Your goals and my goals are MTA's goals. We are a member-driven union, and I want to assure you that your voice is heard. Over the past 20 years, I have had the opportunity to participate in various aspects of our union, locally, statewide, and nationally where I have learned so much about public education and the importance of being a strong advocate for our members and students. 
My mission is to be that advocate for public education and to represent 19G on the MTA Board of Directors. When I set a goal for my association or membership, I am relentless in reaching that goal. I humbly ask for your support on Saturday at MTA Annual Meeting of Delegates. I know that together we can move forward our vision for public education. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome, Bobby. Okay, so we will move on now to candidates for the retired committee. We will start with Phyllis Newfeld. Thanks, Mary. Good afternoon. My name's Phyllis Newfeld. I'm going to start with what I believe is important to we retirees. I have long believed that the power and the expertise of MTA retirees has been underutilized at best. For instance, I was trained by MTA to be a lobbyist, but never called upon to employ those skills. I would like to see the retired members committee embark on a listening campaign with our retirees to build upon the actions retirees could undertake and build a strong phone tree and email list to activate when needed. It's time to meet with our locals leadership teams to discuss how retirees could benefit the locals. Retirees have a voice and we need to fully exert it. It's time to exert pressure on the legislature to up our COLA based on our entire pension, not just the first 13,000. We need to continue our pressure to eliminate the windfall elimination provision and the government pension offset. The connection we have with our active brothers and sisters in the field is crucial to our fight to preserve and better public education. If the retired members committee could further, the harness, further harness the power of retirees in these fights and learn how to best communicate effectively with the retired membership, we will move mountains. As my last point, I would like to talk about an issue within the MTA and within the retirees. Not all of us agree on the issues and not all of us agree with all the positions that MTA takes. But if we are to be a cohesive union, we need to find our commonalities to work together. Our aspirations of fully funding our public schools, eradicating racism, dealing with standardized testing depends on it. My dream is to have the retired members committee start this process by sitting down and discussing our differences openly and honestly in order to find a path forward together. If retirees can do this and help MTA to do the same, our power and our strength will multiply. I spent 40 years as an elementary teacher in Lexington Public Schools before retiring in 2015, the last eight years of which I was president. I was elected to the MTA Board of Directors from 17G. I spent five years on the MTA Executive Committee. I continue to advocate for public education, educators, students, and recently joined the Wisdom Warriors. I've testified at the State House on education issues, including healthcare and standardized testing. I'm the vice chair of the Burlington Democratic Town Committee and chair of the Social Justice Committee at Temple Shalom Emeth. I love this union and the work we do. 10 seconds. I appreciate your support and your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Okay, next we'll go to Beverly Sakosha. Welcome, Beverly. Hello, my name is Beverly Sakosha. I am running for the board for the retired members committee because I believe firmly that we should have more ESP members represented on this committee. Currently, there are none. We know that we know what our issues are and we want to be more involved and help whenever we can. We are definitely underutilized and could be used more as a lobbyist or also as a mentor for the locals that we serve. My experience at the local, state and NEA levels have prepared me to serve. I have been a former director on the board of directors, region 35C. I've been a member of the Educational Support Professional Committee member. I've been a delegate for over 25 years to the annual meeting. I graduated from the ESP Leaders of Tomorrow program. I was the negotiation chair for Bridgewater Rainham for the ESPs. And I'm currently serving on the CRC committee. National experience, I've been on the 
NEA RA Planning Committee, the Resolutions Committee on the NEA level, and co-chaired co the State Contact Committee. I would like to expand, expand my role in retirement. I want to, want to represent all members to protect pensions, COLA, health care, and support GOPWP revision. I will work tirelessly to represent you at the annual meeting and others and help address challenges and secure lasting and meaningful improvements in the MTA. I respectfully request your vote at the MTA annual meeting so that more ESP members can be fully represented on this committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bev. Okay, on to Richard Liston. Good afternoon, Mary. Hi. I, I'm Richard Liston and I'm running for re-election to the Retired Members Committee. I've served on this committee for many years. Um, I'm a past co-chair with Kay Roberts and a past chair of the committee. I've been active in MTA and uh, ETA, the Ever Teachers Association, practically my whole teaching career. Um, I taught special ed in Everett for 40 years. I spent 28 years as the local president of the Ever Teachers Association, and I'm still active in my local as the immediate past president, which makes me one of the five offices. Uh, we, we led two successful strikes uh, against odds that never could have happened, but we were successful thanks to MTA's major help throughout it. I've served on the MTA Board of Directors, the MTA Executive Committee, and the NEA Board of Directors, as well as the NEA Resolutions Committee. I'm also a member of the Massachusetts Teachers Retirement System, which oversees our pensions. I, along with my colleagues, Dennis Norton, Ann Wass, and Jackie Gorey, have worked very hard to make sure that any member that comes before us is treated with dignity and respect. They have a story to tell, and it is our job to listen to that story and, and to then make a decision. But we need to be respectful. These retirees that come before us have earned the right for respect, and we need to give it to them. I'm also a member of the National Council of Teacher Retirement, where I sit on the Trustee Education Committee. Pension and healthcare have always been my two major concerns as they are both issues that affect retirees and active members. I have constantly lob lobbied for increases in our COLA and for oversight of our healthcare insurance, especially the GIC, which I am, I am a member. I respectfully ask for one of your four votes so I can continue working with the retired members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Okay, moving on to Seth Evans. Seth, are you here? Let me just look at the list. So it doesn't look like Seth has uh, is in the meeting. Okay, so let's go to Dale Melcher. Thank you, Mary. Uh, good evening, delegates. My name is Dale Melcher, and I'm asking for your vote to represent retired members and our interests. A bit about my background. I retired from UMass Amherst after 37 years, where I was an active member of PSU, the Professional Staff Union. I bargained contracts, did member organizing, was a steward, and conducted training programs for the union. I'd like to share what I will bring to this work. I spent over 20 years as a labor educator. I planned conferences, offered workshops that served unions, union members, and worker organizations. And I worked with the MTA to introduce popular education theory and practice to field staff and I conducted trainings for the MTA Executive Committee, board, and staff. 
I would love to bring this skill set to the planning and implementation of our annual retired members gathering and continue to make that a place where retired members' contributions and activism are encouraged. Through my work as a labor educator and many years of developing the activism and leadership of women in the labor movement, I have learned to deeply listen. I planned and taught at two summer programs for women, the Northeast Summer School and WILE, the Women's Institute for Leadership Development here in Massachusetts. These summer programs were the most diverse educational labor programs I have ever been privileged to be a part of. Diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, age, religion, sexual orientation and identity, occupation and economic status. There I learned to really listen and learn and even change my position from the thoughts and experiences of these women. As a committee member, I will listen to everyone and learn from all of you. I believe retirees have a great deal to offer. We have relevant experience and knowledge to share and we can show up. Last March, I helped to organize a Pioneer Valley retired member Zoom gathering to hear about and talk about opportunities to be more actively involved in the MTA. The result, lots of interest and a Western Mass Wisdom Warriors group formed. I want to work with the committee to encourage the development of more Wisdom Warriors groups in other parts of the state. I will work to represent our issues and interests, protect our pensions and health care, and actively advocate for well-funded, quality public education. 15 seconds. Through higher ed. Please consider giving me one of your votes. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. And our last candidate we will hear from is Rafael More Arazo. Thank you, Mary. Uh, hi, my, my name is Rafael More Arazo. Uh, I am uh, running for re-election to the MTA Retirees Committee. I have served for the last two years. Uh, uh, I am a, a Latino immigrant to the United States from Colombia, South America. I have been living in this country for 52 years. I was an educator at the University of Massachusetts Lowell uh, as a member of the faculty for 23 years. And I retired in 2011. I represent, represented the faculty of my department uh, as the uh, MTA MSP representatives on grievances and promotion issues for seven years. Uh, since 2019, uh, I have been a member of the MTA Retirees Committee. I was elected in that year. And during these last two years, I have, uh, uh, have a number of activities. I have uh, uh, represented the uh, retirees in the statewide MTA Environmental Health and Safety Committee, where I have worked for the last, uh, especially the last year intensively, and I have helped to develop the MTA response to the COVID pandemic. I also helped to organize and participate in the retirees gathering 2020. And I, I uh, assembled together a document that was published in the retirees reported summarizing the gathering that was uh, that presented a, a substantial amount of important issues that relate to MTA retirees and MTA members in general. I also organized and participated the uh, retirees branch of 2021 and uh, uh, was uh, part of uh, dealing with the issues of COVID that was uh, a, a part of the focus of that branch. I am asking for your vote to be reelected for the next two years. I think it is important for us to connect with the rest of the MTA as retirees the connection could be done and is being done through my activities with the Wisdom Warriors in which we have provided support, personal support of actions, uh, public actions of uh, active members of MTA. 
I also will continue to represent and promote the environmental health and safety issues, uh, not only of retirees, but of all the members of MTA, uh, all the active members. And I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. So this concludes tonight's pre-convention meeting and we will see you in four short days. Enjoy your week, stay well, see you Friday. Thanks everybody.